Today's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from the, these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance. But one, is, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptised by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfil all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptised, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's, it's lovely to see you here. Uh, this morning we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew. Over the next, uh, for, well, the first part of this year, we're going to look at Matthew's Gospel. We're not going to cover everything. Uh, as we look at Matthew's Gospel, uh, we're looking at it, and if you were here last week, as uh, what is the, the book of origin, Matthew's Gospel begins uh, with the word, the, uh, the Genesis, so uh, that should draw up for us uh, the beginning of the Bible, so, uh, so the origin, it's about a new creation uh, taking place, the, the time of fulfillment being now that God is doing a new thing. So, so why Matthew's Gospel? Why are we looking at this? Uh, often when I look at the Gospels, I love to spend time in Luke's Gospel or John's Gospel. Uh, well, uh, Matthew's uh, Gospel is particularly written to, to Jewish people. So why is it relevant to us? Uh, if you want to think of the audience of Matthew, he was writing to a, a predominantly religious group of people and he was telling them about Jesus and instructing them in, in how to live a life following Jesus. Uh, we, we live in a world that is quite religious. Uh, but we in this world that is quite religious need to learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. Uh, often I, I, I use this little phrase, Old Testament Christians. Now, now, you may see this and go, well, oh, hang on, that, that doesn't make sense. Old Testament Christians, that's, a, that's an oxymoron. Those two things don't fit together, Old Testament Christians. Uh, well, in order to understand it, let me break it out. In, in the Old Testament, it, it was about an outward righteousness, uh, doing the, the right thing. Uh, Christians, actually, it is about an inward righteousness, God doing a new thing or new work in us. And so if the Old Testament is about uh, displaying, living the right way, uh, the, the New Testament is about an inward change. 
Uh, we're, we're given a new heart in order that from this inward place where we can live in, in a way that brings glory to God. We can live righteousness out from an inward place. What is righteousness? Living the, the ways and the purposes of God, living according to God's word, that not, not being uh, right in the eyes of others, being right according uh, to how God calls us to live. Uh, so, so Old Testament Christians, why, why is this relevant? I, I think it can be really tempting for us uh, to live in this world as religious people. Uh, think of the religious people in the Old Testament. Uh, we, we don't look or dress like them. Uh, they, they, but they used to go around and they used to parade around in order to what? Be seen by other people. Uh, who would we have said the religious people that had an outward display yet no inward change? We, we'll call them the, the Pharisees often, uh, referenced as the Pharisees in the Bible. Who they, they lived in a way that looked right before other people, but everyone knew that they were hypocrites. They didn't do the right thing when other people weren't looking. So I want to introduce to you this, this phrase of Old Testament Christians because I, I think it challenges the way that we live in the world. Uh, I'm going to come back to it. But right now, if you want to open up your Bible, we're on page 784. And uh, we are looking at uh, John the Baptist. Uh, so how does... Matthew's Gospel present John. Uh, he's in the wilderness of Judea. He's clothed in camel hair. He's eating locusts and wild honey. If any of the characters in the Bible, he was the wild one. Uh, he, he was the guy who was a little bit on the edge. Uh, he was said as the, the voice in the wilderness. So we're looking at chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, the vo we're on page 784. Uh, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Uh, he was uh, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, he was proclaiming a message. Uh, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What, what does that mean? Uh, turn away from your old way of living to a new way of living because uh, God uh, is establishing his throne on earth. As it is in heaven, the reign of God has been established on earth. He's saying, uh, he's fulfilling Isaiah, preparing the way of the Lord, making his path straight. That is, uh, we, we looked at it around Christmas, uh, making an opportunity that all people could see and follow and worship uh, Jesus. So he's preparing the way for Jesus to come. And he's also a spiritual tourist spot. Uh, the Pharisees have come to check him out. Uh, and all the region along the Jordan, it says in verse 5, and, and we're, we're coming to him. Uh, the, the people of Jerusalem and Judea, they were coming to him. Uh, you, you might see it almost in their day as on page 3, there's this little article uh, saying people are going and being baptized in Upper Yarra Valley by the river. Uh, they're finding new spiritual renewal as they go and do it. Uh, maybe that's something you should check out. And so this little story uh, in, in the newspaper and people going up and checking out to find out what's happening. In, in many ways, if you were a religious person, that's what you needed to do. And, and so the Pharisees uh, were going and following and John wasn't happy about that. He was confronting them saying, well, you, you are doing the right thing in the eyes of people, doing what religious people do, being washed, being cleansed, uh, turning away apparently, but you, you, you need to actually bear fruit that keeps with that. If you, if you say, I'm no longer going this way, I'm going this way, you need to actually bear the fruit of living and going that way. So, so this is John, he's presented to us. Uh, what is John's baptism about? Uh, I've said it's about four things. It's about a prophetic witness. Isaiah, some 400, 800 years before Jesus, uh, speaks of a time uh, of the establishment of the throne and the reign of God. Uh, John is now bearing witness that that time is being fulfilled. Uh, so we see verse 3, he's fulfilling what the prophet Isaiah spoke about. Uh, John's baptism is also about repentance. He, he's saying, uh, re repent, uh, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
What does it mean to repent? It means metanoia, to, to change your thinking. Uh, so instead of thinking about people and the world and the purpose of life in this way, uh, you were to turn and begin to think about it in a, in a different way. Anything that didn't line up with the ways of God and the way God sees the world, uh, turn away from that, repent, and live and think uh, in a new way. So it was about repentance, people making a choice to live for God. And it was about cleansing, uh, a, a ritual cleansing uh, that people would feel clean before God. Uh, after a hot, sweaty day, uh, it's nice to have a shower. You, you feel clean. Uh, going under in the waters and then coming up out of the waters, uh, knowing you're doing that as a, as a sign of your commitment to God and cleansing of sin, people would have come away from that as a spiritual experience where they felt clean. Often when people uh, are baptized, they, they describe how, how they feel new coming out of the waters of baptism. Uh, so there's a physical cleansing, but there's also a spiritual element to it. Uh, John's baptism was also about preparation, people being prepared in order to have open ears to hear a new message uh, from Jesus when Jesus arrived. So looking at John's baptism, which is a good thing, how does this thought of Old Testament Christians fit in there? Uh, when I say Old Testament Christians, uh, we, we often uh, can view things as Christians living today as rituals that are empty. Uh, we might do things and have no idea why we do them. I, I have uh, friends who, who taught me things that Christians know that I never got taught. Uh, they, they would say, oh, why are you eating... Uh, why are you eating meat on Good Friday? Well, as Christians, we, we only eat fish on Good Friday. I said, oh, I'm a Christian. Uh, I, I don't do that. Where do you go to church? I, I don't go to church, but we, we only eat um, fish on Good Friday. Oh, why do you do that? I'm not sure. So, so an Old Testament Christian knows what they need to do. They don't, they don't know why they do it and are not necessarily changed by it. So if, if we see, receive John's baptism, we, we could uh, be baptised and then just go on living the same way. Lots of Christians are criticised in our world because they live no different to anyone else. Uh, so John's baptism not resulting in a preparation happening in someone's heart or a turning around of someone's life. Uh, so Jesus comes along. And so we're down in verse 13 on page 784. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be uh, baptized by him. So why, why did Jesus get baptized? Uh, John said, of, there's one who's coming who I'm not even worthy to untie the, the sandals on their shoes. Uh, Hebrew slaves were not legally allowed to wash the feet of and take off the sandals of their masters. And so when John says, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, uh, John is, is saying, <laughs> uh, I, 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 even, I, I couldn't even fill this position. Uh, I, even if I was allowed to, I couldn't fulfill this position. So, so why did Jesus get baptised? Uh, one is prophetic witness. Uh, he came to show us uh, who God is. Uh, if Jesus rode in on a horse uh, and claimed his throne, we would see God as, as powerful, dominating. Jesus shows us uh, that actually the way of God is one of humility. Uh, God takes on flesh, then comes and lives as one of us, lives how he calls us, to live, and so he fulfilled all righteousness and bore witness to us as to who God is, as a witness prophetically to us as to the nature of God. Uh, was his baptism about repentance? No, we know Jesus was without sin. He hadn't ever done the wrong thing. He hadn't ever missed the mark, but it was about focus. For, from here, this is the beginning of his ministry. Uh, 
Uh, he, he sets his eyes toward the purpose that God has for him in this small window of three years of public ministry. Uh, it was, was it about cleansing? No, Jesus wasn't in need of cleansing, but it was in setting apart. When, when you're baptized as a Christian, it's about you being set apart from the rest of the world as God's person. Uh, Jesus being set apart for the purpose of God and uh, preparation uh, for the ministry that is to come. So what does the preparation look like for Jesus? Uh, after they've had their little to and fro where, where Jesus uh, it says, I want to get baptized, and John says, I'm not going to baptize you, and Jesus said, let it be so now, uh, John consents and baptizes Jesus. And when Jesus had gone under the water in baptism, uh, just as he comes up from the water, uh, we're now in verse uh, 16, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Think of that picture. So think of a dove. Uh, the Spirit of God is coming like a dove. Those who looked on saw the Spirit of God coming like a dove and lighting on him. You, you might think of a, a brilliant light coming and shining on Jesus. And that's an image that these translators of the text have given us. Uh, what does the text say? Uh, if you look at a different translation, this is why it's useful if you read the Bible in the NRSV like we're reading it this morning, but then uh, read a different one at home. It, it's really useful because you see different ways in which the same words can be interpreted to try and communicate to us what was going on. So here we have this picture of like a dove coming, flying from the sky, uh, landing on a person and, and lighting them up like a spotlight shone on them. That's a picture. Uh, to you and I, that's a picture that seems very foreign. Has anyone seen a light like a dove come and land on someone? Very foreign. <laughs> uh, what the text actually talks about is, is how the, the spirit descends like a dove, so it uses that picture of a dove, and then rests or settles on him. Now, what, what does that look like? We, we actually have no idea what it looks like for the, the Spirit of God to rest and settle on him. Uh, what do we know? That there was a presence of God in that place. There was a, a weightiness of God's presence. Uh, think of the times in the temple where the presence of God and the, will come and the priests couldn't stand to minister because the presence of God was so heavy. So, that, so the heaviness of God is resting on Jesus in order to prepare him for ministry. Uh, let me uh, expand that picture a little bit for you. So Genesis 1, uh, the, the world is formless and void. And then the Spirit hovers above the water. Uh, what, what, what do we see happening in, in Genesis 1 verse 2? Uh, the, the, the Spirit is hovering over the water, preparing for what is formless and void to suddenly have shape and meaning. Uh, a new thing is about to happen as God speaks creation into being. Uh, so the Spirit is hovering over Jesus in the same way. Uh, Noah, uh, the ark, uh, the world's flooded. Uh, Noah's on the ark. He sends out the dove to go and see if there's actually any land. The, the dove comes back, brings an olive branch, uh, sends the dove out again, and the dove doesn't come back. What, what's that picture of a dove speaking of there? Uh, the, the whole land in Noah was flooded, literally baptized, and then the dove is the symbol of the new season has come as the dove goes out, but the dove in that picture doesn't stop and remain. So it, it speaks of this new season. God is doing a new thing. Uh, so this is really significant for us. The, 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 the Spirit is, is coming. And then what we see is a voice comes from heaven. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So God the Father from heaven says, this is my son. I'm pleased with him. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. There's only two spots in Matthew's gospel where God the Father speaks. Here and in the transfiguration 
Uh, and what does he say at the transfiguration? This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What is the nature of God? What is God like? Well, we say look at Jesus, but what is God the Father like? We know God is love. Here we see the kind of love that God is. Uh, Old Testament people view God as distant. They had no experience or understanding of God as good. Uh, he was to be feared. He was angry. He was distant. You had to please him in order to earn favor. That's the picture that they would have had. Here we, we get a picture of God as Father, as lover, the true revelation of who he is. So what is God like? God is love, and he loves us. So here we, we, we have Jesus getting baptized. We see some significant things at the start of his ministry as Jesus is being prepared. So what about Jesus' baptism? John talks about that. Uh, verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. I, but, uh, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. So it's a baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Je Je Jesus baptizes in this way. If you're a Christian and you've been baptized... Uh, we have been baptized into Jesus' baptism. It's not this kind of two baptisms, a, a baptism with the Holy Spirit, a baptism, or three, baptism with water and a baptism with fire. But what it is for us is a picture of what Jesus wants to, on an ongoing way, do for us. As Christians, we're, we're baptized once as a sign of our uh, being part of the body of Christ, being joined to Jesus in faith, being raised with him. We're baptized once in, in the water. Uh, the, the ongoing work of Jesus' baptism in us is the Holy Spirit and fire. So, so what's we, we know about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who came like a dove and rested on Jesus for empowerment. And, and Jesus, uh, we'll see through, John's, uh, through Matthew's gospel, gives us a picture of what it looks like for the, to live a life where the Holy Spirit, uh, you're in step with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit working through you. Uh, we, see, we see that in Matthew's gospel lived out by Jesus. But what, what about this fire? Uh, just before, uh, you'll see as John's talking to the Pharisees, verse 10, he talks about an axe laying at the tree. Uh, and he, he says to them, uh, don't presume just before verse 9 to say your, to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. But I tell you, God's able from these stones to raise up children. He's, he's addressing their hypocrisy. Uh, you, you know, uh, a Jewish person back then might just claim their, their lineage as uh, a witness that all God's promises will be fulfilled to them. An Old Testament Christian might not live differently, but just say, on the survey, when it comes out, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and say, because of the family, because I've ticked this box, uh, everything good's coming to me. Well, John confronts this idea. He says, uh, for those that don't bear good fruit, uh, the trees are cut down and thrown into the fire. Uh, so so what's, what's the purpose of fire? To consume everything that is not fruitful for God? To consume anything not of God? That's the purpose of fire. So what is the baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire? What, what's the purpose of the fire? The Holy Spirit is to empower and change and transform. What does the fire do? Gets rid of everything that's not of God. Uh, in our lives as Christians, uh, we should not just have a, a time that we can point to where we were baptized with water. Uh, we should actually have times where we can see the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts and our lives. Times where the fire of God has worked in us to burn off what is not of God. 
An Old Testament Christian lives the same way. No experience of the Holy Spirit of fire. Is distant from God. Hasn't a deep understanding that, like Jesus heard, this is my son or a daughter who is beloved. Distant from love. What's Jesus' baptism? What, what purpose does it serve to refine us, set us apart, draw us near, get rid of anything that is not of God? So this morning, where, where are you before God? Maybe you're not a Christian. The first step is actually baptism. To say prophetically before everyone, I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe you are a Christian and when I speak about this baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and fire or even the presence of the Holy Spirit at work, you don't have a deep awareness of that. Then, then you're... Next step is to say, God, come and renew me. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit again. Burn off. Bring holy fire into my life to burn off what is not of God. So how do I go about being a New Testament disciple of Jesus instead of an Old Testament Christian? Uh, that's one of the reasons we're, we're reading Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Matthew challenges us from our religious sensibilities uh, to live wholeheartedly as disciples, read through Matthew's Gospel. Uh, one of the things we, we do often in the Anglican Church as Christians is a period called Lent. Uh, Lent is the, the 40 days leading up to Easter, uh, it's celebrated uh, as a time of fasting. Uh, so p people will often say, I'll give up chocolate for Lent, or I'll give up TV for Lent, or I'll give up coffee for Lent, or, or something like that, and not do anything different. That's kind of living like an Old Testament Christian. I've given up this for Lent. Given up hot cross buns, I probably should, for Lent. That's living like an Old Testament Christian. The, the purpose of Lent, so the meaning behind the ritual, is that we seek our heart to be prepared. Now, all of us need hearts that are closer to God. So we use this time in order for our hearts to be drawn near. If you give up chocolate, it's uh, you... Uh, uh, and Kirsty, I'm not saying you have to give up chocolate. Uh, <laughs> If, if you give up chocolate, it's every time you think of chocolate, it's a prompt or a reminder for you to spend some time in prayer and focus on God, saying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Refine me with fire. Uh, if you give up TV, it's to use that time, not just because that's a good thing to do to have time spent elsewhere, but it's so you can use time to actually draw near to God, spend time in prayer, spend time reading the Bible. Uh, Lent starts uh, on Wednesday, so we, we have pancakes Tuesday night. Wednesday, we, we have an Ash Wednesday service at the beginning of Lent. Uh, Lent is celebrated, sorry, you, people keep their fasts of Lent on every day except for the Sunday, because Sunday is a day of celebration. So that's why the, the numbers don't add up if you're a numbers person. There's not literally 40 days. Uh, so Sunday's a breaking fast day. Uh, but on the other days, using it as times to draw near. So, so how might Jesus use this for you? I, I'd love you to have a think and pray about that. And this week on Wednesday, start something. Do something. Do something that's realistic and then say, okay, God, I'm going to use this as a time to draw near to you. So that in this period, I'm, I'll look back over 40 days and say, I'm, I'm closer to God than I was when I started. What, what might it look like for you? Uh, let me pray. Uh, God, I uh, thank you that m you meet each of us uh, with where we're at, with what we need. I uh, thank you that you love us and that you care for us. I uh, thank you that we see your, the beauty of your nature revealed to us, that, that you uh, love uh, your, your son Jesus. Uh, Lord, we long to hear that voice, that we are your son or your daughter with whom you are well pleased. I draw our hearts to you. 
Uh, strengthen us in faith. Uh, renew us, we pray, Lord. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.